So I think we can begin now. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our final EpiWin webinar for this year, which is on a very interesting topic. So I think we can begin now. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our final EpiWin webinar for this year, which is on a very interesting topic. I think we can begin now. So uh, good morning, good afternoon. Apologies for the echo. Uh, once again, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, very interesting webinar as our final EpiWin webinar for the year. It's on emerging biological threats. What are they and why are they a risk? Uh, we have uh, very eminent speakers today with us. So I hope you'll find this webinar very interesting. But before I go on to introduce them, some housekeeping um, announcements. First of all, this is being recorded and it's also being streamed live on YouTube in the EpiWin channel. Uh, secondly, please introduce yourself in the chat box. And if you have any questions um, throughout the webinar, please put them in the Q&A box so that it's easy for us to track and our experts can respond to them as soon as possible. Uh, the format will be the Q&A format. And um, at the end of it, we will take questions from you as well. And I hope all your uh, queries will be addressed. This will also then be put on our website. So you can access um, this later on if you want to watch it later, some reason if someone missed it. With that, I'd like to warmly welcome our eminent panelists. We have here today, Dr. Sylvie Briand, who's the director of the Department of Epidemic and Pandemic Prevention and Preparedness. We have Dr. Tom Inglesby, who's the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security at the Bloomgood School for Public Health in the US. Then Philippa Lentos, associate professor, for Science and International Security at King's College London, and um, Dr. Polian Lim, who's the director of the High Level uh, Isolation Unit at the National Center for Disease Control in Singapore. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Matthew Lim, who's the unit head for health security at WHO. And so we have experts from all the four corners of the globe today. And we will look forward to hearing what they have to say on this. With this, I'd like to invite Dr. Sylvie Briand to provide the opening remarks. Thanks a lot, uh, Supriya, and uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone uh, uh, today, and to be part of this uh, uh, discussion, which is, uh, as Supriya said, important as well. You have seen in the past nearly three years now the COVID-19 pandemic, how it has spread and, and the impact. And what was really interesting to see or sad sometimes to see is that even well prepared uh, realize that they still can learn from this kind of crisis and there are always surprises. And so um, it shows us that first preparedness is extremely important, uh, but even when you are prepared, you can still be surprised. So it's very important to discuss before crisis, what can happen and share our thoughts, ideas and, and um, visions on this future so that we can be all collectively better prepared. At WHO, we are focusing mostly on natural events, meaning this uh, emergence of new diseases that are natural, uh, coming from uh, most of the time uh, zoonotic uh, diseases or animal origin, and that can produce outbreaks. And then if it cannot be contained at the stage of outbreaks, it becomes an epidemic and sometimes a pandemic. So this is what we do most of the time because it's a part of our mandate uh, under the international health regulation. 
but we recognize as well that they can we can have other ways to um, have epidemics and pandemics it's uh, either by accident an accident in a laboratory for instance or a, a deliberate event i mean somebody really uh, wishing to harm uh, other people and, and and trying to spread dangerous pathogens so it's important also to uh, to um, discuss uh, those uh, potential events, uh, although they are uh, very rare, uh, if they happen, it can have uh, catastrophic consequences. And so for us, uh, it's also something that WHO uh, cares about and try to um, uh, advance the knowledge on this kind of uh, how to respond to this event. In addition, it's very clear that uh, with the improvement of, uh, I mean, certain technologies, but also development of new technologies, uh, such as synthetic biology, for instance, it's possible to uh, recreate viruses. And so that's why it's important to regulate somehow those um, uh, technologies to make sure that we are not increasing the risk for humanity. So urgent to discuss those risks openly, uh, really not to scare people, but rather to hear from experts different point of view and perspectives so that we can collectively find solutions in advance to crisis and also to reduce the risk hopefully because uh, nobody wants to face another covid-19 um, in the in the near future um, what we have learned also during COVID-19 is that uh, and it's the nature of pandemic that it affects many countries at the same time and so it's very important to collaborate. Uh, cooperation between countries is absolutely key. And that's why to be really prepared for the next uh, event, uh, we really need also to strengthen our collaboration and cooperation uh, between disciplines, between sectors, between countries, uh, so that uh, the whole humanity uh, is better prepared. So with this, I give you back the floor, Supriya, so that uh, we can uh, start uh, with our distinguished speakers and, and hear more about this uh, very important field of work. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Uh, a very important uh, point, uh, important words, actually. Collaboration, cooperation, it's much needed uh, all over the world. But now I'd like to go back to uh, Dr. Tom Inglesby and go to ask him to explain actually what is an emerging global biological threat? What exactly does it constitute? How do we, are the criteria for defining it? It's very much topical, but how would you identify one? Great. Well, thanks so much, Supriya. I really appreciate the invitation to be part of this webinar uh, and really uh, fantastic colleagues here. I think there are a few different concepts that people are trying to convey when they talk about global biological threats. And the first concept is around emerging infectious diseases. So the US National Institutes of Health defines emerging infectious diseases as diseases that have newly appeared or have existed prior, but are really rapidly increasing in incidence or in geographic range. So pathogens that might cause these kinds of emerging infectious diseases can pose small threats, larger threats, limited outbreaks, or more broadly in the world. And a couple of examples of things that would be on that list of emerging infectious diseases might be Lassa fever in West Africa or West Nile virus in New York City or, or cholera in the Caribbean. All right, so that's one way of thinking about global biological threats. A second different way of categorizing biological threats on a larger scale are the actual or potential new pandemic threats that humanity may face. And obviously these would include the ones that the world and the WHO have recently lived with and had to confront 2009 H1N1, polio, Zika, COVID, monkeypox. And they could include pandemics that could arise in the future that we don't yet know about, new diseases. And the WHO has made clear that future intentional epidemics could be caused by pathogens that are not currently known. And WHO calls that unknown pathogen disease X as a way of kind of reminding us all that there may be unknowns in the future. And then I just wanna raise one third concept that also people may, some may be talking about when they think about global biological threats. And this would be a way of thinking about the most extraordinarily or highly consequential biological threats. And a term that's been used for those kinds of threats 
is global catastrophic biological risks. My colleagues and I have, have earlier published a working definition of that term, and people may use it differently, but our term in our center is that global catastrophic biological events would be those events in which biological agents, whether naturally emerging or re-emerging, deliberately created and released or laboratory engineered and accidentally escaped could lead to sudden, extraordinary, widespread disaster beyond our, all, all of our collective capability to respond to them and could lead to great suffering, loss of life and damage to governments and relationships in society. And so one example of that threat could be, uh, fortunately we've never experienced that, but something related to H5N1 influenza. Fortunately with H5N1 influenza, there've only been about 860 cases in the world in the last 20 years. On the other hand, the case fatality rate for that disease is very high, more than 50%. So if that virus were to evolve naturally or through some kind of laboratory engineering, through, through some kind of manip manipulation in the lab, that could lead to some kind of global catastrophic biological risk. Another example of that would be the return of smallpox. If that escaped from a laboratory where it's currently held and began a pandemic, that could lead to extraordinary global consequence. So Priya, you also asked in your opening comments about whether there's a process for predicting or identifying global biological threats. And what I'd say to that is that there's no single universal system for rating global biological threats, but depending on what kind of, what, what problem you're working on in this space, there are programs, there are tools that help people think about global biological threats. And so some examples of those kinds of tools, the US, at the US CDC, they have an influenza risk assessment tool that assesses on kind of a continuous basis what the US CDC thinks are the most serious influenza risks that are out there in the world. The WHO has a strategic risk assessment, which is, assess, which is a tool for assessing all hazard risks, not just biological risks, but also useful for national planning purposes. My colleagues and I published a, a, a report that might be interesting to some uh, in the audience called Characteristics of Pandemic Pathogens, which identified properties of pathogens most likely to cause human pandemics. And of course, there are many different kinds of important laboratory risk assessments that can gauge specific laboratory risks. And finally, there are also programs and tools that could help with very early detection and forecasting of new threats. So traditional surveillance tools that we all know about that are very important for identifying earliest human cases, wastewater surveillance programs that have really been valuable with COVID and polio. There's some machine learning tools that are getting better predictions, but that's still a research tool. And then some uh, governments have really strong forecasting programs. The UK has a uh, great effort there. And the US just launched a new center for forecasting and analytics at the CDC. So just in closing, I would say ultimately pathogens that have the combined characteristics of high transmissibility and high virulence or lethality pose the greatest global concern. But as we've seen with COVID, even pathogens with an overall infection fatality rate, that's a lot less than 1%. If they're efficiently transmissible, they can really lead to global havoc. And so for now, predicting precisely what will be the next actual global threat to circle the world is not possible. There's some level of irreducible uncertainty, but we can build systems of early detection, preparedness, and response that help us broadly to be ready for the next pandemic that we face. And I'll stop there. Um, that's that's very comprehensive um, and quite concerning, you know, with high transmissibility and high uh, variability. But um, you know, not being able to predict it. Would any other panelists like to add to what Tom has said? Any uh, insights that you might like to add as well? Not really. Then uh, what I'd like you to um, uh, explain to us, Philippa, considering what Tom has said, is we don't really have a precise way of predicting uh, the next um, big biological threat so how much of a uh, is a risk is it to society today what is the threat level and why well hello there everyone 
Um, it's nice to see greetings from all over the world pouring into the chat and the q and I see we're well over 300 uh, in attendance at the moment. It's wonderful to have you all with us. Um, both um, Sylvie and, and, and Tom sort of introduced these uh, three overarching categories of, of biological threats, so natural biological threats, accidental biological threats, and, and deliberate biological threats. But we're seeing increased risks across all of these areas with um, a range of consequences, as, as Tom pointed out, from, from low impact to significant impact to really catastrophic uh, consequences. Um, and these uh, threats affect not just humans, but could also affect animals uh, or plants and crops and other material uh, as well. I suspect this uh, audience is most familiar with natural biological threats. Um, we're seeing in this space, we are seeing spillover risks and risks of emerging diseases increasing, as, as Tom was saying. And there are all kinds of reasons for this, as you will be familiar with. Uh, primarily, they're related to human behavior. You know, we are encroaching ever deeper into the natural world. Uh, we're coming into contact with unknown viruses that are then uh, starting to infect us and, and, and spread. I suspect you may be least familiar with deliberate biological threats. Thankfully, it's not something that we've had to uh, experience uh, in our lives uh, lifetimes. Um, but here too, we're seeing barriers coming down to developing biological weapons. And again, there's a whole range of reasons for why that's happening. Some of that is down to simply advances in science and technology. Sylvie, in her opening remarks, uh, mentioned synthetic biology. Uh, that's one aspect. There are all kinds of other aspects as well, such as AI and machine learning and convergence with other technologies, um, et cetera. So science is enabling us to do new things that we've not been able to do before, including uh, causing harm, essentially. Um, we've also got a very precarious security situation globally. Um, and it is possible that uh, situations might arise where biological weapons uh, are viewed as advantageous weapons. We are um, in a reasonably good position in that there is something called the Biological Weapons Convention, which completely prohibits biological weapons. Um, um, and we have to make sure that treaty is strengthened. And actually, this webinar is taking place at a particularly interesting time as this treaty is currently undergoing its five yearly review, which is which should be closing tomorrow. Um, hopefully, there will be a, a deal on the, the floor when that happens. But uh, again, that remains to be seen. I actually wanted to focus on the uh, third of these um, categories of, of biological threats, that is um, of accidents, so um, or accidental uh, releases of uh, infectious agents. This obviously relates both to research targeting uh, natural bio threats and to uh, research targeting deliberate threats. And we're seeing an increase in high-risk biological research. And one example of this is, is gain-of-function research, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. There's been a lot of discussion around that uh, of late in, in the media, uh, also in policy circles, as the United States is currently undergoing a review of its uh, regulations in this space. And Tom has written wonderfully on that, so hopefully we can get into that in the, in the Q&A afterwards. Um, but this is... Gain of function research is essentially where um, scientists are actively trying to enhance the virulence or the transmissibility or other characteristics of potential pandemic pathogens compared to naturally occurring strains. So in other words, there are these are experiments that make viruses more dangerous. And that, of course, means higher risks of accidental infections, which could lead to local outbreaks. Um, and theoretically, um, uh, regional or, or global outbreaks as well. Now, in addition to more extreme high-risk research, we're also seeing more labs uh, being built, um, more maximum containment facilities 
uh, as well as other kinds of uh, laboratories at lower containment level. Um, in my own work, I have been tracking how many of these maximum containment level uh, labs there are, not because they are necessarily the most dangerous, but because there's less of them. And so they're easier to identify, essentially. And it's a good indicator of, of how this trend is, is panning out. So <clears throat> there are now around 70 maximum containment labs that are operational under construction or planned. Um, and they're spread across 27 countries around the, the globe. Um, you can have a look at these yourself through my project. We've made a, a map publicly available of these labs. Go to globalbiolabs.org and you can play around with this map and learn more about these uh, institutions and also the biorisk management laws and regulations that the countries have in place, uh, the countries where these labs are have in place. Um, of those 70 or so labs, most are in Europe, then uh, Asia and then North America. And about 80% of these labs are located in urban areas, uh, which of course heightens concerns about accidents at these facilities. The number of these labs has been growing um, around the world pretty steadily over the last couple of decades, but the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, has led in a build has led to a building boom in these labs and since the start of the pandemic nine uh, countries have announced plans to build 12 new BSL4 facilities or maximum containment facilities um all countries but particularly countries uh, where high risk pathogen work is conducted should have laws and regulations and institutions in place that maintain oversight of them um and that require comprehensive risk assessments of proposed research for safety, security, and dual use activities. So um, that I think is, is one of the key takeaways really that um, we need to make sure we've got the proper regulatory framework in place as well as the right culture um, in these institutions uh, of safe, secure, and responsible science. And um, the final point I wanted to make um, on this, uh, in this area of um, of accidents, is that we're. I, I've talked a lot about research that happens inside, right? But there's actually also all kinds of research that happens outside of laboratories with um, with pathogens or disease causing biological agents. So um, another an example here, um, another example actually of extreme high-risk biological research is the growth in large-scale viral prospecting. So this is research, for example, in places like bat caves, where scientists are trying to identify potential pandemic pathogens in the wild before they spill over into human populations. And there may well be benefits of this kind of research in the future, though there are many, myself included, who would argue that there are other less risky prevention and mitigation strategies that should be adopted uh, instead, because actively searching for dangerous viruses in the wild carries significant risks of scientists becoming infected while collecting biomedical and environmental samples. And it's particularly concerning because standards for field biosafety are much less developed than for lab biosafety. So there are very few countries, if any, that have national field biosafety standards, and there's no international guidance available on this subject. So I would encourage the WHO to take the lead on, on developing some of these um, biosafety standards for field work. Um, and so uh, I guess my message, while Tom's message was, we, you know, we need to build protection preparedness and response mechanisms or strategies to deal with these uh, biological threats. Um, my my smaller piece of the pie essentially would be we need to make sure we've got, first of all, bio-risk management um, tools um, and laws and regulations on the books, both nationally and internationally. And we need to make sure those are also implemented uh, in practice. So with that, I'll turn back to you, Supriya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippa. Uh, very, well, first of all, congratulations on the map that you've put out. I'm, I, I see a lot of uh, mm -hmm. inquiries on that. And I think um, that's something that people will find very useful. And for highlighting 
the need for a proper regulatory environment and also the culture, as you mentioned, um, of the right culture for safe, secure and responsible science. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, would any of the panelists also like to add to what Philippa said? Um, if, if not, I would actually then like to ask uh, Dr. Pauline Liam, uh, you know, Philippa's talked about the risk and need for responsible science. Um, how prepared is the world? I mean, as she mentioned also, you know, the threat is many of these labs are in urban centers. How prepared is the world for such a threat? And what can global and national decision makers do to address this threat? Hi, thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation to speak. Um, <clears throat> preparedness is really a very um, challenging thing to think about because it's changing and dynamic. It also varies across um, several dimensions. Um, it varies across countries, geographically uh, and within countries and across regions. Um, but preparedness is um, for emerging biological threats, um, such as uh, lab inadvertent releases, as well as deliberate events. Um, can be at the, you can think about it at the level of the ability to detect and diagnose. Um, would you know if something hit you? Um, the ability to, the capacity to treat and manage. I mean, how do you prepare for something? How do you prepare treatment for something when you don't know quite what's going to hit you? And, um, and to look at the level in terms of, um, um, you know, health capacities, health facilities, um, the ability to sort of contain it in terms of infection prevention and control and public health systems. So a lot depends upon the starting conditions of an emerging biological threat. Um, so for example, if it's a stealthy release, you know, like male anthrax or whether it's a large scale attack, you know, uh, an explosive uh, event, then, you know, that the scale of that will be very challenging and the ability to be prepared for that um, in different countries and different systems can vary quite a bit. But the other way to think about um, preparedness for emerging biological threats is to also think about it at the level of community resilience. So, um, you know, is there trust in health authorities or the government? Um, is there social cohesiveness or would it sort of lead to, um, you know, divisiveness in the, in the society um, uh, and uh, mental preparedness of the population for something like that? sort of a total defense kind of approach. Um, so to answer the question about whether the world is prepared, um, I'd say that the world is not well prepared because um, we are only as strong as the most vulnerable um, group, uh, whether that's within a country or across countries. And so one of the things that we need to look at in terms of whether the world is well prepared for an emerging biological threat is to look at it at the different levels, but also across different um, regions and countries. And at this point in time, I would say that there is um, a, a range of preparedness um, and, and at all levels, we probably need to sort of level up and strengthen that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pauline. Um, that's um, concerning, I have to say. If if the you know if we're only as prepared as the most vulnerable group, and so we do have some work to go to do going ahead. Uh, the Sylvie's also put in in the chat some uh, the WHO document on biosafety labs, biosafety for all our audience here. They might find that useful, uh, and that's something that's being done at the global level. I will then ask Matt Lim, who's our unit head for health security, you know, uh, with this situation, with the need for uh, community resilience and, 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 and trust as well. Uh, what can we as the public do to protect ourselves in the face of emerging biological threats? That's a great question, uh, Supriya, um, and thanks for inviting me to join the panel. Um, it's uh, great to be here. Um, so I've been listening to um, all what all the panelists have been saying, and I think the fact that we're not really commenting on each other's words means uh, says something. We we actually are all uh, very much in agreement about many of the basic principles of uh, the the scale of the risk and and what to do about it. 
So in response to your question, I'd like to make two broad recommendations and then one caution. So the first broad recommendation that I would say is that for members of the public, there's actually a lot you can do to protect yourself. Um, we've talked about some scary things here, but the foundation of protecting against any kind of biological threat, whether or not it's natural, accidental, or deliberate, remains good public health and remains a good attention to taking care of yourself. So very concrete things that people can do is um, making sure that they and their families and their communities are in the best possible shape that they can be. Um, a very concrete thing they can do is make sure that they get vaccinated. Um, we forget, for example, that measles, um, one of the most contagious and most deadly uh, diseases in history, um, if, if, we saw, if we saw measles emerge today as a novel virus, we would consider it a major uh, ca global catastrophic biological risk. But we don't because there's a very effective, very safe vaccine for it. And so no, no, nobody really thinks that there's going to be a, a civilizational um, a catastrophe due to measles because the vaccine is that good. So if we commit to protecting ourselves, um, protecting our families through basic public health measures, um, that's the first thing that you, can, that you can do to increase resilience and increase um, your um, uh, your preparedness uh, for, for any kind of biological risk. The second thing that people can do um, is, is really be aware, really be engaged, support um, those leaders in your community and in your society and your nation who advocate for good public health, who advocate for sound preventive measures, uh, be, because uh, your, your voice actually makes a huge difference. If people tell their leaderships they, they expect it um, as, a, as a criteria and for sound government and sound leadership that their societies will invest in preparing for these risks, then it will happen. And then all the things that various the various other panels have been talking about, about better governance, better oversight, more international collaboration, it will be prioritized if people ask for it. So those are the two concrete recommendations. My final caution, though, is um, there is one new aspect of this, which um, if, uh, if you grew up uh, in an age before maybe the internet or social media, maybe we didn't think about this too much, uh, but we, we, we now really do have to think about that. And that's dealing with misinformation and disinformation, um, the propagation of false narratives. And so my caution is, um, as you're educating yourself and as you're supporting political leaders and, and policies that improve public health, be just a little bit careful of where you're getting your information from, weigh that information, uh, listen to trusted sources, uh, or, or try to discern which sources you can trust. There is a lot of bad information flowing around now. And there's a lot of purveyors of bad information and they're doing it either, I don't really know why, they want to draw attention to themselves, they're trying to sell you something, um, they're trying to gain political influence for themselves or whatever reason. Sometimes people are doing it because they think it's funny, but there's a great deal of bad information out there. So uh, my caution is uh, be judicious in, in what kind of um, information you, um, you take in and how you form your judgments. But there's a lot people can do at an individual level to, to protect themselves, I think. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, very good points. Uh, firstly, you uh, keep yourself the best possible way, that, you know, including vaccination. Secondly, make sure your governments know that you expect them to be prepared as part of good governance. And thirdly, the misinformation part, which of course is increasingly a, a, a threat in our world. And our infodemic management colleagues are working with a whole community of infodemic managers as well to that, but each of us has to do our part. Uh, so that's what we do at the community level. But if I may go back to Pauline, uh, <clears throat> to talk about uh, what you think uh, national governments may could do in the state. Uh, Matt mentioned about we having expectations from our government. What should they do? Um, thanks very much. And I, I do think that that's a very important component um, that we uh, need to focus on, that national governments, decision leaders, uh, decision makers, health authorities can do. 
um, is to use the assessment tools that are already there for emerging uh, preparedness. So there is a tool that WHO uh, has uh, worked with uh, uh, countries called the Joint Evaluation uh, uh, Exercise, the JEE, um, and many countries have done that. There is a component within the JEE for looking at preparedness for emerging biological threats. Um, and to, to sort of pay more attention to that, there is another tool, the NSAT, uh, which looks at national security components. Um, and there is also um, another uh, lab, the, the lab biosafety manual has just been um, uh, revised, uh, prepared by the BSP group, the biosafety uh, group at WHO that uh, Dr. Matt Lim heads up. Um, if we were to use the existing tools that have been developed uh, carefully over time, and uh, use that as a guidance for preparedness nationally, um, that would be very helpful. So the second thing you can do is um, work on training rapid response teams and first responders, um, giving them some awareness of sort of um, the possibility of uh, bio threats. Um, so there are CBDE, Chem Bio Deliberate Event uh, online training modules that have been prepared by the BSP unit at WHO. Um, that uh, and they're available on the WHO training platform, so Open Who and uh, WHO Academy. Um, so these are free and they're open source. Uh, they, they, they're freely available. Um, and um, the CBDE uh, training modules uh, help uh, are, are sort of directed at different groups of people, sort of a general awareness, and then one for health professionals and eventually one for public health uh, professionals. Uh, the, the second one would be for clinicians. Um, and then there's also uh, mass gatherings is the other place that is a place of vulnerability for emerging biological threats. So there actually is a CBDE sort of risk assessment tool and uh, uh, tools for sort of dealing with risk mitigation and risk communication for mass gatherings um, that's also available through WHO. So um, using those tools for, for uh, assessment and for training, the third part is to work nationally at strengthening um, the different pillars of preparedness. So based on what I said earlier, if you think about it, we need to strengthen uh, lab diagnostic capacity because you have to confirm the event before you can um, move forward with uh, other actions, um, whether it's um, to stop the next uh, attack or else to, um, to uh, treat appropriately because everything hangs on the right diagnosis. Um, we need to strengthen lab biosafety and biosecurity in terms of inadvertent or deliberate release from labs. Um, and then the, the other piece that we often forget about is infection prevention and control. So if someone that's affected by a deliberately released uh, bio threat, by bio, biological agent ends up in an emergency room or a hospital, you know, are the infection control practices um, strong enough at baseline to prevent a massive amplification event in your hospital? Um, and, you know, we sort of experienced that, for example, with, um, uh, with SARS, uh, SARS-1, where there were three lab uh, um, accidents. And thankfully, it was a near miss because that never triggered a second uh, outbreak of SARS back in 2003, 2004. Um, another pillar that's really important to strengthen would be internal reporting workflows. So if you see something, how do you escalate, escalate that to the appropriate decision maker? And then the last piece is of risk communications. The fourth major piece of preparedness that national um, authorities can deal with is simulation exercises. Now, simulation exercises uh, take a lot of resources and preparation, but they, they, the, the advantages are that it makes it real for the people involved. Um, secondly, if you reveal gaps in the simulation exercise, they are things that you can plug and work on before the real thing happens to you. And then the third thing is that it really brings together different sectors that normally will never meet, but you don't want them to meet for the first time of a hot event. So, you know, it's the clinicians, it's the lab people, it's the public health people, but also potentially national security, police, um, the ministries of transport, home affairs, agriculture, <laughs> whole bunch of people that normally would never meet and having them meet in a simulation exercise and begin to understand where the lanes are, where they should collaborate and coordinate and not step on each other's toes would be very helpful. So I think if you sort of focus on those four things, 
um, that we can do as national uh, health authorities and decision makers to prepare. The assessment tools, the training, um, strength, strengthening the different pillars of preparedness, and then simulation exercises. We will be able to sort of bring us to a different place of preparedness, you know, within the next one to five years. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that that sounds hopeful in a very concerning situation that uh, within the next five years, we could make good progress uh, if we can follow these uh, four suggestions uh, that you mentioned. Would any of the other panelists, uh, all of you have had long experience in this field, like to add on uh, what national governments could do? Uh, yes, Tom, please. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Supriya. I think we'll certainly just agree with uh, my fellow panelists and the comments that have come uh, since I uh, offered remarks, and in particular what Polion was just saying about uh, the work of national governments. I should say Polion just participated in an, uh, an exercise, the Gates Foundation, as a as a panelist in an exercise and was extraordinary. Um, the only things that I might add to that list would be uh, the importance of of political leaders continuing to press forward around preparedness. There is a very, very well known uh, cycle that we all live through where we have an extraordinary kind of searing event around the world like COVID or monkeypox and a lot of shock and attention and then it goes away. And there are, there are efforts underway, which if supported by our political leaders could make us much safer. Ones that have been described already, but also another thing, for example, called the 100 day mission, which is this aspirational for the moment effort to try and shorten the timeline for getting new vaccines in, a, in a, the next pandemic crisis. But that's only gonna happen if there are, if there's political support in governments around the world and a lot of engagement with those who you know, research and develop vaccines and therapies. And I see in, in, you know, in various places in the world that there is now very little attention to these problems again, people have moved on. And so it's important for people, the leaders that are on this webinar uh, in their positions uh, to continue to, to advocate for political attention to these problems. We can't just respond to them in the moment. We have to build our plans over time. And so uh, I just wanted to add that to this already very, very uh, valuable discussion. Thanks, Tim. That's a very important point. I see Matt also has, both Matt and Philippa have their hands up uh, uh, very quickly in the interest of time. Could you make I, I, I think Philippa may have gone, uh, have had her hand first, but I'll just make a quick intervention. Um, so in addition to uh, what Tom just said about preparedness and what Polian said about preparedness, uh, again, one of the things that, um, that we really need to emphasize is that all, so much of preparedness is actually activities that should be routinely incorporated into daily living and the daily functioning of systems, regardless of an outbreak. Um, it, it's the informed clinician at the bedside who may pick up the first case of something unusual. It's the routine diagnostic laboratory that may collect the first sample from a, from a, from a new outbreak. It's the data sharing and, and, and collection and the transmission of data to national public health authorities that, that may facilitate the speed of information. And these are all things that, you know, just as you wouldn't build a, a, a super highway saying, well, we're only going to use the super highway because just in case there's a national emergency, we need the superhighway to speed um, uh, trucks back and forth. Well, no, I mean, you would build a superhighway so that people on their, in their daily lives could get about their work uh, safely and efficiently. And then the infrastructure is there so that if you need it in a real emergency, people know what it is and they're used to using it. So a lot of the preparedness work really goes down to just reinforcing doing good practice on a routine basis. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Matt. Uh, that's really important point, a very good point. Philippa, over to you. Thank you. I just also wanted to say how wonderful uh, Paulian's comments were so positive and, um, you know, tangible things that we can do to address these threats. I think that's wonderful. Um, I wanted to um, 
add another um, dimension, which has already been been brought up around um, misinformation. There was also some comments or questions around this in the chat around misinformation, because I think that is something we are seeing um, increasingly, certainly in the health space, uh, certainly in the threat space, um, generally in our society, but certainly around around health. Uh, and if there was ever, if there is an outbreak, whether that outbreak is naturally occurring, uh, you know, accidental or deliberate, will have a lot of both misinformation and likely disinformation around it. So misinformation is, of course, just repeating false information. You don't necessarily know that it, you it's false information that you're repeating. Disinformation is actually um, more akin to information warfare, where you're you deliberately um, fanning wrong information as a way to confuse the picture. And we've seen much more of that recently, including in the current war uh, in Ukraine, where there have been uh, a lot of claims about public health laboratories in Ukraine um, being, uh, you know, covert facilities for bioweapons activities and that sort of thing, um, which, which are, are, are blatant lies. Um, and so what um, Matt was saying, there's a lot that individuals can do to ca to counter misinformation. You know, you should always ask yourself, is the content reliable? Who is the author? Uh, what's the source of the claims? Uh, is the information outlet reliable? All of these things. But there are also many things that states um, can do. Uh, and so this is where I just wanted to add to the four uh, that that uh, brilliant points that uh, Polyam made related to the JE. And this isn't part of the JE, of course, but, you know, maybe it should be in the future. But for now, you know, there's lots of states can do and, and primarily to raise awareness that there is such a thing as misinformation and disinformation. Um, I think states should also be um, promoting trusted sources of information um, and voices of authority. We are seeing, um, you know, an erosion of trust in uh, authoritative um, institutions, in facts, in science, um, and we need to bolster um, those sources of, of, of information. Um, you know, governments can provide access to tools for critical thinking. Education, of course, is hugely important here, but obviously not everyone has access to higher education. This is the sort of thing that we do in my institution. We 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 train students to think critically, but obviously not everyone has access to that. And there are actually lots of other tools that are being developed, including in video games, for encouraging critical uh, thinking. So there's lots that can be done. Uh, fact checkers can be supported. There's loads of different fact check checkers, uh, polygraph, stop fakes, notes, loads. There's loads of them that can be supported. Um, and also thinking about how to um, um, expose and limit um, you know, misinformation as an institution, as a public health institution, I think is also crucially important. It's very so, important thanks. point, Philippa. Uh, and, and that's something that my colleagues in infodemic management here at WHO is uh, working on with uh, under Sylvie's visionary leadership, uh, you know, but uh, it leads to another dimension. With that, I'd like to invite Sylvie actually to tell us a little more about um, you know, WHO's role, she was, you know, she's been in this area of uh, emerging uh, biological threats for a very long time. And also to, uh, you know, conclude, to give some conclusion remarks to this uh, very, very interesting webinar. Over to you, Sylvie. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Supriya. And I think it's, uh, it, it has been really a very fascinating conversation. We wish to have much more time, especially yes. to discuss the last points of infodemic management. Yes. So I hope we can organize um, a, a new webinar on, on this particular topic. Um, because um, WHO has pushed a lot for infodemic management at the beginning of this uh, pandemic. And, and the name infodemic uh, shows that how viral could the uh, um, inaccurate information be and the, the detrimental effect it can have on, on, the, on the response to uh, an event. So uh, we are particularly concerned about this aspect uh, of um, uh, 
I mean, in the new information ecosystem in which we are living. And that's why also we have created the infodemiology, which is a science uh, that uh, um, a science of infodemic management uh, so that we can generate evidence on uh, first uh, how, uh, how to measure the infodemic, but also uh, to measure the impact of the intervention that we uh, make uh, to uh, counter myths and disinformation. Uh, and because we have seen uh, that certain intervention, although uh, well intended, at the end have a completely counter, uh, I mean, negative effect in reality and are fostering uh, misinformation rather than diminishing it. So I think it's a whole range of, of um, uh, new knowledge that we need to develop and, and also acquire uh, if we want to be ready for the next pandemic. And, and this would be a, a little bit to echo what uh, Matt has said. Uh, uh, there are a lot uh, we can do uh, now uh, to get ready for the next pandemic. Um, but I think what is very important is first to learn the lesson from this one. Uh, the COVID-19, what are the lessons learned? What, what did you see that, that we didn't do before and that uh, we, we, we need to do uh, in the future? Um, Tom, for instance, was mentioning the uh, wastewater surveillance. So this is a kind of innovative way of doing things that uh, we need probably to incorporate in our uh, new normal and new ways of, of, of routinely uh, strengthening systems for uh, uh, surveillance of, of those kind of events. But what is important as well is to uh, imagine the future and we need to imagine that probably the next pandemic will be completely different. And, and so, um, because we tend very often to uh, fix the problem of the past, uh, but uh, not really anticipating what could be the problem of the future. And this is why I think this discussion we have today is so important because we need also to imagine that maybe uh, the next uh, pandemic will be due to an accident in laboratory. Maybe it could be due to a deliberate uh, event. So, uh, and we don't know. And so that's why we need to uh, imagine those kind of things. Of course, nobody wants them to happen, but uh, being ready means also that you have un envisaged all the possible scenario and you have started to put in place uh, the mechanism to be able to respond to them. So I think it's, it's um, uh, what we do at WHO, uh, first we try to um, uh, prevent natural events. And as you know, 70% of the outbreak uh, have uh, an origin in, uh, animal, uh, in animals, uh, meaning that most of the viruses are uh, from zoonotic origin. So uh, we are working very closely, and this answer one of the questions uh, that was uh, put in the Q&A. Um, we are working very closely with OIE and FAO, other uh, UN agencies and UNEP as well on the environment to uh, understand the drivers of um, spillover from animals to human and try to prevent those spillovers as, as much as possible and as early as possible. So this is one of the activity um, and, and a very important one. And to answer another question in the chat where the person was asking if there are uh, geographies in the world where the risk is higher uh, for those natural events and, and emerging viruses, yes. Uh, there are places that we call hotspots and we are currently updating the mapping of those hotspots, but places where there is a huge um, biological diversity uh, are often more prone for those kind of emergence because then viruses who are probably host in uh, uh, one, um, one family of animals or, or, or plants and so on, have more opportunities to spill over to other uh, uh, type of animals or plants or, or humans. So uh, certain areas in the globe are more prone for those uh, uh, spillover events. And so this is where also we focus our attention and efforts to try to prevent pandemic before they occur. Um, the other thing that uh, we do really, and, and this is also a question that was posed about, uh, and, and this is under Matt uh, Lim, uh, um, responsibility and, and his team uh, is really to reduce the risk of accidental events. So the biosafety in lab, and I've put the, the link to the, the guidance, but also looking at what can be 
uh, a dual use uh, of research of concern and how we can also uh, provide guidance to avoid uh, this kind of dangerous research. So we have also produced a guidance on uh, responsible life research so that countries can assess their risk and, and, and take the right decision regarding research. And, and one, odd, one person was asking, okay, why should people make research on, on dangerous pathogens and, and this is really risky for the world? And, and I fully agree, but for instance, I remember a few years ago, there was a, a, a scientist, a very high, a very good scientist, by the way, uh, but he tried to uh, recreate uh, uh, pox viruses, uh, or spark virus, and, and really the aim was to see, is it easy to do? And how long does it take? And how much does it cost? So this is interesting information, of course, but it has some risk. So we need, if we continue to have this kind of research, we just need to make sure that this kind of research is, is really well regulated and that we minimize the risk as much as possible because the aim is really not to create new, more virulent viruses uh, just, for, just to see what it looks like. And uh, this is not acceptable. So we need a research that really looks at the benefit for public health and um, and that if it's dangerous, then we need to have even more safeguards uh, to make sure that uh, we reduce the risk as much as possible. And finally, what WHO is doing really uh, on deliberate events, of course, it's not really our mandate, but uh, we try to um, uh, first uh, establish collaboration with other sectors, and in particular the defense sector, uh, because we know that uh, if there is a deliberate event, probably, um, it will start as a normal event, a natural event. Uh, but just after some time, we will uh, realize that uh, it's not very natural and it has been uh, an event uh, deliberately um, um, created. Uh, but so we, we will need at this point in time to have um, uh, the right um, cooperation with, uh, with a different set of stakeholders. And so this is what also uh, the team of Matt is, is really working on and establishing this uh, uh, working relationship with other sectors to make sure that uh, the day it comes, uh, we also can still uh, put in place this uh, collaboration and cooperation that is very much needed uh, in time of, of crisis. And uh, if you allow me, uh, I've not had time to answer uh, so many questions, but uh, I just would like to highlight uh, also how timely is this information, is this discussion, because uh, currently in Europe and in the US, there is a high circulation of H5N1 in poultry. And also we have seen spillover in, in some mammal, mammal species like uh, minks and, and ferrets. And so um, this is just to say that uh, many, many agencies in the world are just monitoring this risk, are, are trying to anticipate what could happen um, uh, Tom mentioned that there are uh, guides developed also to um, uh, assess the, the risk, uh, but we have also developed a candidate vaccine for H5N1. So in case, and really I, I, I hope it will never happen, but just in case uh, we have spillover of this virus uh, uh, to human population, and if in case it triggers sustained uh, we are already re getting ready for it, and, and we have in the pipeline uh, a vaccine that may be ready, uh, the, um, the uh, antivirals as well, and, and we are also um, updating our guidance for uh, member states so that they can uh, deal with uh, respiratory events and get ready for those events as well. So I think uh, it's not because we are still uh, facing the COVID-19 pandemic that we are not anticipating other threats and we are very actively working to uh, control the risk. So with this, I give back the floor to you, uh, Supriya, and uh, hopefully we can also answer the other questions maybe in writing later on. Thank yes, you. Well, thank you very much, Sylvie, for that very comprehensive um, uh, yes, summary, which has actually answered a lot of questions that we've got from participants. Um, so I hope, which is a really good thing because we actually have reached the edge of time. Uh, but we will respond as far as possible to all the questions that you have sent us. Uh, and we'll share it also with some of our speakers and see if we can get back to you on that. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, would, would you be, would you have the time to take one or two questions perhaps? I'm just putting it to the panelists, although we're sort of short on time. Okay, maybe. One, very short. 
questions yeah <laughs> very short so uh so th there's one question that talks about the risks from the melting of permafrost with climate change and all that is that a risk um, and and how seriously are we taking that risk the reemergence of old pathogens if I can, uh, I can answer that. Yes, yes of course. Yes, we, we are uh, looking at this risk at the, especially we have looked at this risk related to uh, uh, smallpox because that's the 80s. Yeah, true, yeah. And so uh, the virus is not circulating anymore in human population, but it was in the past. And so the risk of uh, um, uh, the, I mean, uh, digging in the permafrost and, and, and finding, for example, corpses uh, from the past uh, could be a risk. So we have uh, uh, had a discussion with uh, ACVVR, with its, uh, our uh, um, expert group on research on uh, uh, variola virus, and, um, and they are looking at what is the real risk uh, of doing research on, on uh, those um, corpses uh, that were... Um, uh, taken from the permafrost and 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 all those research uh, in the environment for viruses that may have uh, uh, still uh, may have remained uh, over uh, decades. So um, and actually uh, uh, most of the time the risk is very low and and can be very easily uh, controlled with um, uh, biosafety measures that are usually in place. Uh, but of course, um, it's, it requires that the people doing this kind of research are uh, uh, researchers uh, that are trained and, and that are aware of the risk. So, uh, I mean, to echo what uh, Philippa said earlier and, and other uh, speakers, it's very important that uh, we, we train really scientists and especially young scientists uh, to be aware of those risks and so that they can apply the, the correct measures to limit the risk. Thanks very much, Sylvie. That's um, that's good to know that the risk risk is low, considering what we're seeing with uh, climate change and yeah. um, the sort of the permafrost uh, being melting right now. Uh, another very quick question is uh, uh, based on our experience from COVID nineteen and other outbreaks. What are five areas that need strengthening? Who would like to take that question? And that will be the last one uh, because we are now five minutes over time. Um, only five? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I can quickly in a minute summarize five, but I'll give you some ideas and the others may have some uh, other ideas. So I mentioned some of these already. Yeah. We really, really need to have better diagnostic capability pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. The ability to sort of analyze samples in real time um, and then get the information out as appropriate to international authorities like WHO and then shared with the international community under fair and equitable um, uh, uh, terms and conditions so that we can improve the overall public health response. So that's several capabilities right there. Um, and then um, I think a lot of what Polian was saying are, are things that these are very concrete things that governments can do right now. Uh, they can they can institute pandemic planning. They can institute whole of government attention to preparedness. They can start collaborating with civil societies like right now. Uh, they can bring in civic leaders and talk about what would we do in the unlikely but real possibility that the, that this happens and start laying some concrete planning. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't cost huge amounts of resources. It does cost a little bit of time and attention uh, on something that is not you know actually happening at the moment, but it pays off big dividends in the end. Um, we can invest in uh, better, di uh, better, um, uh, more, more rapid um, uh, 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 production, development and production of countermeasures. Uh, we can invest in um, uh, building a production capacity. These are all very concrete things that are possible. Um, so that, yeah, I don't know where I am, but that's less than that's five or right. more than five. But <laughs> okay. great, thank you very much, Matt. Okay. Uh, and if any of the other panelists would like to add anything to that, mm -hmm. if not, we have we're actually seven minutes over time. So thank you very much to 
all of the distinguished panelists for very, very interesting perspectives and insights. Um, and thank you for the participants uh, for your interest and for your questions. Uh, I hope some of those were answered through the course of the discussion, including uh, Sylvie's remarks at the end as well, which address some of them. And, and we hope uh, to continue uh, to have you in all our webinars in future as well. And we'll try and answer as many of your questions as possible. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues as well, uh, Jiang Fang and Yubika, uh, who've been instrumental in organizing this webinar. Thank you very much for your support. And wishing all of you a very happy holidays and a very happy new year and look forward to seeing you in January. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.